<laughs> so I have, I have a disproportionate amount of bootnecks on this. I, I know I've heard. Oh my God. I've had a bit of a drought recently, though. Anyway, Steve McCulley, absolute, uh, absolute pleasure to have you on, bloody. Thanks absolute for having me. Pleasure to have you on. Uh, so uh, we, we could ice break, since you're a petrol head. Yeah. As you mentioned off air. F1, Russia on the weekend. Mm-hmm. In fact, I said to the missus, I'm going to ask her about Vettel. She said, no, don't. I said, I'm going to talk to her for 90 minutes about Vettel. <laughs> she said, don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to talk that long about Mate, him. Mate, I know. I wouldn't want to talk that long about him. But uh, what did you take of Vettel's... Did he throw his teddies at the pram? Or well, not? I, well, I'm not dis- sure. Dis- disobey afterwards. orders. Is that what you mean? Well, pulling so over uh, when he shouldn't have. Or so let's bit. so let's set the scene for people who uh, yep. who may be interested in motorsport. But in fact, set the scene anyway, whether you fucking like it or not. We won't talk much about this. But so Ferrari one two, Leclerc on, no Leclerc on pole, Vettel in number two, Mercedes at number three and four. So the plan was launch off the start. Vettel takes the slipstream of Leclerc, overtakes Leclerc to go into first place to deny the Mercedes getting between them. I yeah. didn't understand that bit. Can you but, yeah, explain that? because it's me? such a long straight. The toe was quite a big thing there. And they knew that actually anybody behind Leclerc in pole was probably going to jump him. So I'm, I'm guessing, reading between the lines, Ferrari decided, well, it's best that we get uh, Vettel to slipstream Leclerc, get past, and then swap them back because Leclerc was the faster driver got pole position instead of a Merc instead of a Mercedes slipstreaming getting past exactly. are, they, are the Mercedes quicker off the mark I mean it just no it just depends on the driver really <clears throat> okay but um, it was all about the, the toe on that specific uh, start line and I think they probably didn't anticipate that Vettel then kind of actually got a bit of a gap on Leclerc yeah. so uh, they probably anticipated Leclerc to be right behind him but he had a kind of a second and a half gap and um yeah, then Vettel kind of, I guess, disobeyed orders from what it sounded like. Obviously, yeah, we don't know. I, they asked him twice, didn't they? I mean, yeah. the first time he, he, they said, Let, are those headphones all right? Is it coming through one year sometimes? That's fine. That's yeah, it's fine. fine. Um, they said, they said, to him, right, let him pass in the next lap. Or let him, you're going to let him pass in the next lap, whatever. And Vettel said, no, he's, he's too far away. Yeah, he said, close the gap, then I'll let him pass. And then, uh, yeah, and then the next time, no, the first time, sorry, he said, well, no, I would have beat him. I would have got in front of him anyway. Yeah. And then the second time he asked him, he said, uh, "No, he's catch me up." And then they did the pit stop, and Leclerc came out in front. Yeah. After some, yeah, after some like interesting radio chat there, and then Vettel broke down anyway. Yeah, which not his fault. You know, no. at the end of the day, engine no. went. No, but then they told him to pull over, which meant the safety car came out. Yeah. Hamilton pitted. And then Hamilton ends up in front and wins the race. Yes. Leclerc was third? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's third behind Bottas. Yeah. yeah. And then there was questions around why didn't Ferrari say, get yourself all the way back, crawl back into the pit lane to prevent the safety car coming out? Yeah, but they they didn't. They told him it was, uh, well, yeah, there was an engine issue where you have to stop now or else it's going to blow type yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What do you think about Vettel? I don't know. I, in yeah, general? I think he's, he's had his time. Mm. Basically, and you know, there'd be a lot. Of, he'd be under a lot of pressure. Clearly, <laughs> new kid in Leclerc in the team. He's clearly quicker, um, probably hungrier because he's young. And yeah, it'd be difficult for Vettel. But I, I, yeah, I think he's in a team that probably in- implements some of the highest pressure you can of any of those teams. Yeah. Ferrari, man. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, I think he's, he's probably uh, yeah. Who knows what? Whether he'll be pushed or whether he'll jump, but um. Yeah, I think he's, his time is up. Whereas Hamilton, who started in the same era as Vettel, he's you know he's still on top of his game. Yeah, sixth world championship coming up. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Um, were you a petrolhead before the boot next? Um, typical bloke. Always been interested in cars, uh, but never you know never thought I'd get into racing or motorsport. Um, I guess a bit of a pipe dream. You know, it's a lot, lot of money. And so, so no, I guess it wasn't on my radar. It was, um, it was just you know something I followed. But you know, I'd never been to a, a Grand Prix or anything like that. I still haven't actually been to a Grand Prix race. Oh really? No. Um, um, and so no, it, it was literally when I got injured. That's how I got into motorsport whilst I was in rehabilitation. So it's it's pretty fairly recent. Injured in Afghan. Yeah. He did Ireland, Kosovo, Sierra Leone. 
Iraq, Africa. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I joined. Yeah, I was commissioned. Was it ninety seven? So, yeah, Tony Blair just taken over, and then you know, Labour government sent us everywhere for about yeah. Well, my I nearly did eighteen years in the end. Yeah, mm. it was a busy, busy period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a proper busy period. I do I, when I talk about it in the past, as I said, like you know that it is the sweet spot. Yeah, of operations for the British forces. Yeah. You know, just did people had a chance at everything i joined in 2000 so i got a couple of got a couple of short northern ireland tours in yeah and then again everything everything on from there it was um lucky if you look at it that way um, no totally i mean a lot of guys looked at it as being lucky serving during that period but then all, at the same time there was a lot that had um you know operational fatigue mm. you know back-to-back tours and certainly you know when it came down to you know, Power Reg, Marines, Teeth Arms. It would be the same guys going back out and doing the combat stuff. And yes, you know, we can spout off about how many tens of thousands of British military served in Afghanistan. But, you know, the, the guys, you know, I'm not taking anything away from all, all those people, but the guys that are actually, you know, on the ground walking out of checkpoints each, each day, it'd be interesting to know what the figures were. But I could, yeah, it'd be less than a thousand, definitely less than a thousand, you know, that have probably actually been in kind of day-to-day firefights or IED situations or whatever. Over what? T- what, what less than a thousand and what? Over the whole campaign? Yeah, if you, well, if you add, add it up, because you've got a, a lot of these people, they've, they've kind of gone back and back and back again. Yeah. It's the same ones oh, that I are see. getting caught I up see. in firefights and so on. I don't know. I I remember I remember when I, remember when I was leaving, um, there was, so I said with three power, I remember when I was leaving, at some point, I can't remember who said it to me, and they were saying that. So I, I ended up doing three Afghan tours, and they were saying that. So the first one was 06, the second was 08, and then the third one was 2010, 2011, it was a winter tour. And there was someone saying that of <coughs> within three power, there's only. Sounds weird, this. Within three power, there's only 14 people who did all three tours on the front line. Is it, okay. When I say on the front line, I mean exactly what you say, going yeah, out, yeah. out at checkpoints. Where, where is, oh, this uh, was quite a check. Yeah, okay. But. I don't know where that figure came from. Yeah. It could be dog shit. But at the same time, we are, did have a high turnover rate. Like after the 06 tour, that first one, man, we lost so much time. Like so much, because the people who the full screw sergeants, secret message sergeant majors, done it. And a lot of them went, yeah, fuck this. And, and left, you know, because they, they sort of, they got what they wanted. At that point, they, they were at that point in their career was where is decision point, where, whatever you're doing, am I going to stay in? You're like 12 year point, am I going to stay in for longer? Am I going to get out? And, and then I've got out and I said, oh, well, I've done that now. Let's go, what, how can it possibly get better? What can I possibly achieve? More than that, let's, let's suck it. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we had a similar thing. I, I, only around the maritime security kind of area where there is a, a few years where a lot of guys were like, oh, actually, I can go and earn however many hundred pound a day doing maritime security. But that bubble burst. Yeah. Um, it was a pretty short bubble with Maritime, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. It, was, it was a longer bubble with CP. Yeah. It, it, well, yeah, a, a longer bubble with CP. And, well, CP is still going now, and, and sort of the manpower is still about the same, but the money is just dog shit. Whereas with Maritime, the money plummeted, but also the amount yeah. of expats on the team plummeted, actually. Whereas that, I think initially, you know, it started off, it was, you know, XSF, X, you know, Marines, Power Edge, and so on. And then they opened it up and up and up and up and up until eventually. And so, as you say, so the, the wages would, would go down and <coughs> therefore the guys would be like, well, actually, this is not for me. The problem is, you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of, I suppose if, once you had done a Iraq and Afghan tour, then it, it did come down to guys that wanting to earn more money. Yeah. Yeah, Rather absolutely. than looking for action, it was just a case of, well, actually, I can go and put my life in a little bit of danger and be paid a lot more money. So mm. I'll go and do that. Yeah. 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 And then uh, the problem with that is that the problem with that is is that people went out and did that and then never never considered what they're going to do when they get back. Yeah, exactly. Really? As in, when they come back to the UK, I, I know, you know as well, people who are out in the circuit now, like, or do my own security and they have done nothing else since they left and, they, and, and that's all they were I know I was on a contract in Iraq and there was a 67 year old a 67 year old bloke working in Iraq on an 8 and 4 rotation 8 weeks in Iraq 4 weeks well 3 and a half weeks at home when you take the travel in 67 yeah. mental I suppose some guys you get maybe I don't know you, you, know, you get a big mortgage or whatever you know you kind of start living a lifestyle that requires you to earn that kind of money yeah. And you, you know you wouldn't be able to get that in a kind of a what we call a normal job back in the UK. So you, I guess you're a bit tied in. Mm. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, different these days. You can get more earning back in the UK than flipping construction work. 
yeah. than, than, the, than the, the wages you get in Iraq in a minute, depending on the contract you're on. It's absolutely rubbish. They're doing, I mean, I've heard $100, $120 a day. Really? Yeah, I mean, I'm out of t- I wouldn't know. Mental. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, yeah. Crazy. But again, when you've got nothing else to come back to, you've got no other, you've got no other experience under your belt. You can't see any other option but stay out and do it. You're stuck in it then. Especially if you haven't got any savings to come back and give yourself a few months, even just a few months um, breathing space to try and get a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel for those guys, you know, I feel for those guys. Yeah, that does sound like a shit situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, what injury did you get? Um, so, uh, lucky I've still got all my limbs faculties, so I'm lucky in that sense. Um, so mine were mainly internal injuries. It was a dire- directional fragmentation charge. Okay. Um, the the Taliban they they knew I was the commander, so I was specifically targeted. We we, we kind of know that because later that day, electronic warfare specialists yeah, they picked up the Taliban communications and they you know they were praising Allah and they they were telling the the Taliban commanders that they'd killed the local ISAF commander. So we we know I was specifically targeted, and actually on that specific patrol, like, I know which which guys triggered it because we were. We were, you know, watching them whilst we patrolled. I had them in my sights, and I was like, "Yeah, those guys are up to no good." We know they're, you know, they're kind of following us. They're reporting back, but obviously because you can't, you can't exactly you can't do anything until they pose a imminent threat to someone. That's um, interesting. I've had some interesting conversations with some people about dickers and whether you should or shouldn't be able to shoot. I think it depends what time you were in Afghan. At this time, it was definitely it. It wasn't a situation where you you could do it. Ah well. Yeah, and I, it was, yeah, all depending on the situation. I mean, I never knew of a time when it was always all right to shoot a dicker. It was, no. It's all in context yes. and all that. And uh, um, and the discussion I had with a guy called Ben Griffin, who was an ex-Hereford guy, and he, he didn't serve in Afghan, he served in Iraq. He was ex-Tubar, ex-Hereford, and now he's he's a member of an organization called Veterans for Peace. And we had a discussion, and he was... In his head, he according to him, if if you shot a dicker in Afghanistan, you would, in his words, get away with it every time. Whereas if you did that in Northern Ireland, you would never do that. Well, two two different two different scenarios, and no, number one, two different scenarios, and number two, that isn't the case. Yeah, that isn't the case. No. I know ninety nine point nine percent of the times, if I decided to shoot a dicker, I'd be in jail now. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, I'd be in jail now. But um, so it's interesting to say that. Are you happy to talk through the? Are you happy to talk through the patrol? Yeah, yeah, no, very happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate people that, although I got blown up and put in a coma for three weeks, I, I can I can still remember everything vividly right up until being carried onto the helicopter and being put asleep. So it was Whereas, it daytime in London? Yeah, it was probably uh, mid midday ish. Do you want to go through it from the morning? Yeah, well, yeah. I suppose really, I should probably go from the day before. Go from where you want to go, mate. Because it just adds a bit more context. In fact, okay. In which case, I'm going to wind back six days. Listen, we got an hour and a half, but <laughs> okay. you, you crack up. Um, all right. Some serious context. Uh, we were Juliet Company Four Two Commando. We were a ground holding company. Um, so our primary role, role was, uh, you know, we had six checkpoints. It was to provide security and assistance to the local population. A uh, bit of mentoring with the Afghan National Police and Army. Although we only had, I had three police checkpoints in my AO. Um, with about 20, 25 Afghan police. But they actually came under the command of um, police further south in a different AO to us so that was always that was quite tricky and we had I had a eight man Afghan army section attached to the company and that would rotate every six weeks and so you you basically get them in train them they get you know get to about week six seven and they would start being was it normal at task then? no 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 we were a ground holding company but right, they, right, right. I'm just I suppose I'm just trying to you know give a bit of um background to where we were we, we were working in not Nadi Ali North but whereabouts I'd say that, yeah. Whereabouts? So Sh- Shazad was uh, PBHQ. Yeah, yeah, same for us when we were there. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we, when were you there? Were you three power? East? Yeah. Oh, we took over from you. Oh, did you? Yeah, so I was over at Kamar and all. Uh, so, PB Kamar. And, um, so what, what tour was that? You? Uh, that winter tour, 2010, 2011. All oh, right, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, we t- I had to go from B Company. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All oh, right, well, so you know Gaz Nialli and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You know the area very well. Then I don't need to. That well, Shazad Gaz Nialli, I don't know that well. I, yeah, I, so I know I, it from. I'm a map brecky, but I never, I never went to those areas. I was Quadrat, Kamar. Okay. All them. Um, what the fucking hell? What else was it? Folad. Ah, uh, yeah. Nakila yeah, yeah. Bad. Yeah. So we, I think we were, I think we were west of west. Shazad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Northwest. 
Okay. Small world. Yeah, no, the, and the names are coming back to me now as well. <laughs> yeah. um, it is because I remember chatting over because actually, I'm, I'm now I'm not, you've asked me a question of how do I get injured and I'm now talking different. But during my company command handover, um, I actually got, we actually got blown up in a Mastiff going parallel to Gasney Street. We're going to look at uh, Checkpoint Kami Abbey. And it was on a, one of the, the tracks where, you know, unfortunately your guys are taking quite a few hits. And literally, so I, I'd gone out, we were in Bastion, all my commanders had flown out to Bastion. And we were the first company from 4-2 to fly out. And I'd gone gone forward to do my company commander's recce early. And uh, we were, yeah, in a Mastiff going, going forward to kind of look at Checkpoint Kamiabi. And classic, you know, you come across some ground, you know, stones in the road, kind of looks like, you know, definite marker for the locals. So the, the guys, you know, in the Mastiff, you know, stop, stop the wagon. And there was only myself and the other company commander in the back, plus, you know, the Mastiff driver, commander, gunner, and that was it. And then we had another another Mastiff behind us for its, you know, kind of pairing. And in the back there, you had a, fast, a Ford Air Controller stripey from 2-9 Commander who was going in to replace, to be ready for when my Marines came out. And, and that was kind of it. And... Um, Anyway, the, so the the vehicle commander's like, oh, right, sir, so you you're gonna need to go out and you know clear the area. I was I looked around thinking, where's the where's the where's the, the kind of search guy? You know, where's the search team to do this? <laughs> and so me and the other company commander and a couple of you know, and this uh, FAC from the other wag did kind of. I was like, I mean, this is gonna a pretty uh, kind of a sharp introduction to uh to doing it so we did you know, obviously we've been trained and we we kind of did all the procedures and we went out into the field and along to check for wires for command wires first and so on and as we were going through the field clearing up you know clearing our route as we went a farmer comes over we've got an interpreter and the farmer's you know well, you're ruining my crops going through my field and we said well you know we think there's something on the on the track there's a uh, stones over there indicating an ied so we're gonna we're gonna do our we're gonna clear clear a route and the farm, no IEDs, no IEDs. You know, this is through the interpreter. And so I said to the interpreter, okay, tell him to walk in front of the Mastiff. And then, and so he said it. And the farm was like, no. We're like, okay, so we're going to continue doing that drill. <laughs> so that, that kind of emphasized, we thought, oh, okay, maybe there's something. And, the, you know, obviously d- during your tour, B Company's tour, they, they'd had, I think guys, I can't remember if guys had been actually killed on it. So it was, it was a known, it was a known route. Certainly. Yeah, injured. they had, but I don't think there were three power. So there's a guy I had on the podcast before. Uh, he's a good friend of mine now called Bags. He, he was a tanky commander and he was at Shazad with, with three para. Right. I think in that tour before and I know they got fucking whacked yeah yeah and, fucking whacked and so the guys were obviously pretty tetchy about the whole thing and that route hadn't been used for ages because of it well Gasney was cowboy town yeah man. yeah it was like fucking Star Wars bars everywhere it's crazy isn't it and um, so anyway so we started we're doing our job and we, we cleared about 100 metres down past where the initial you know the sign was and so we thought okay it's just kids like you know how they they pile up stones or do something you know, put stones across the track because they know it slows or even the Taliban do it they, it slows you down they watch see what your pr- procedures are going to go and be suss you out so we thought okay it's you know it's not it's not anything and we can jump back in the wagon driving along suddenly a massive explosion dust cloud you know fortunately properly strapped in all the gear on and everyone's all right but it's a big old blast uh, you know, kind of shaking everyone up, and I kind of I remember looking at the, the company commander I'm taking over for. I can't remember his name, and um, you know, I could see in his eyes, and he looked at me, and we both kind of was like, "Shit, did we just miss that? Have we just walked straight over that?" Because obviously we're clearing out along in the, in the field, then coming back down the track, you know, kind of the 360 jewels you do, and we kind of looked out the back window and the tiny window in the hatch of the mastiff, and we looked out, and we because I remember it was a mark yeah, where we knew we'd cleared up to and we'd literally we'd driven about three metres past where we'd cleared and that's when it had gone off and I wrote off the map yeah, three Mastiff was out for three months the one you were in yeah yeah and so yeah, that was kind of my introduction so even before my guys had got out there had been blown yeah so I ended up, actually I was blown up three times the third time put me in hospital <laughs> so I'm either unlucky or lucky I don't know so that, which way you look so at it so that was six days before that, that no no sorry that was right that was the right at the beginning right. of the tour uh, like I say, my lads, it was during the company commander handover. Mm, mm. Um, wine forward. So, yeah, so we, we primary role, ground holding, um, security and assistance to the local population, a bit of Afghan mentoring for the police and army. Um, and so, you know, you kind of, as you know, you go about doing your, your daily patrols and so on from, from the seven checkpoints. But I also I had about 175 guys 
um had the mastiff group you know and our, our ao was area of operations was about 60 square k which is about the size of reading so you know fairly chunky space to look after 27 checkpoints and but i had the ability to release up to 100 blokes at a time to conduct discrete operations heliborne vehicle borne footborne whatever and um it was actually during one of those operations so early on in the tour we were actually used by co3 para so before my co had even got out uh b company had a an op lined a heliborne op lined up and it was just as we were about to do the command change and CO3 Power actually said to me, he said, oh, have you done any Heliborne Ops? And I was like, well, yeah, I've been in the Marines 13, 14 years and a lot of aviation stuff did the right. You know, I wasn't bullshit, but I'd said, you know, I've kind of we've done a lot of stuff because, you know, on and off of ships and land, all that kind of stuff. So he said, all right, do you want to do it? I said, yeah, yeah, we'll crack it. And it went really well, which was good for me because when my CO then came in, I think CO3 Power had said, well, yeah, McCulley's done a good job on that op. And my CO actually had an ops company and so but when so when the first op came up it was actually j company that did it rather than the ops company which is your company my company yeah, yeah okay, okay. and so we then kind of shared the kind of um or whatever you want to call it kind of discrete neutralization ops or clearance ops or whatever search and destroy yeah all that. i bet they hated you didn't they yeah it's good it was good yeah <laughs> <laughs> initially but he's really good he's one of my best mates um and, but that was what it, what it meant was the, the CO had you know the ability to kind of launch two maneuver units, um, but I, I could whereas the ops company could do that for an indefinite period, I could only do it for I, you know I said to him I could you know I could go up to seven days with a hundred hundred guys and then you know I could go longer but less guys obviously because we still got to man the checkpoints and do the patrols. Do you want to explain for pe- for the benefit of the civvies listening what an ops company is? So I, I guess it depends on your area of operation. So c- commander unit, you know, we were kind of for this talk with three companies um and uh, two of us so we're a four company commander unit but one of our companies was attached uh to uh the which right it was one rifles who took it devon and dorsets did they become one rifles i should know no they're four rifles i should know this it's a long time ago anyway we we had a company detached to them so then we within our commander unit we had two ground holding companies so the job my company's doing another company had that job which is where you you well they took over from you or m company came in i mm-hmm. guess take over from you and then um l company lima company they were the ops company so that basically means the co's got a maneuver element to deploy wherever he feels fit dependent on the situation dependent on what's going on um it might you know brigade may even so that you know my co's boss might even say well actually we want your ops company to go and do a specific job but it it just gives him the flexibility to shift manpower around his battle space basically Mm -hmm. have effect where he wants to otherwise we're all just stuck doing kind of what we call ground holding providing security and not actually being able to progress so we we were in a 4-2 commando was in a in an area where we were still in the clear and hold phase so counterinsurgency you got you know phases of operation clear hold build and then transfer and uh, 4-2 Commando's area of operations was firmly still in the clear and hold stage. Uh, M Company were in a bit of the build, not ready to trans- transfer over yet, but certainly J Company, we were clear and hold still. And then Lima Company was used again to do that clear and hold task uh, within the kind of counterinsurgency um, sphere of operations. Mm-hmm. So back to... So yeah, I've, got, I've gone off a track again. Sorry, so sorry. back to... so. Yeah, got wine forward um, eight, eight, ten weeks, and you know, so far, tour's going very well. But it, it was, you know, there's there's very definite pop, poppy harvest periods, and we were into the period where, uh, you know, where the, the Taliban, the bad guys, whoever, um, you know, the, the 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 poppy farming was complete, and then they would kind of go back to their role of um, being Taliban. And, you know, we know there were, there were clear kind of phases throughout the year where there would be um, more operational and less operational. And that tempo, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it was, uh, so, th- so that was kind of building up and the the brigade commander, the task force, task force helm and commander, he wanted to clear a large area above uh, to the north of what's called the Nari Bugra Canal. And he wanted to uh, basically create new checkpoints that would be manned by the Afghan police and army. He wanted it to be, and this is during a period where 
although it hadn't been announced we were withdrawing we knew it was going to be coming so it was definitely a period herrick 14 was a period where i think politically they wanted to show that we that we were winning that we were able to be in a position to transfer authority back to the afghans and and we could definitely do that in certain areas um and i think this was a a show that the afghans could run their own operation they could clear their own area they could secure checkpoints um the reality was we were obviously holding their hands um so it was a big you know there's a good couple of thousand people involved it was the big you know there's always a big op every kind of tour and this was the big op and for two commanders job within it was to secure a village called Loimanda Kalei um and this was this had been secured years previously but it was in what's called the tri boundary area so it kind of sat between in the in the kind of where three different battle group area of operations met and because it's kind of at the extremities you don't have the manpower to obviously cover you know vast areas of ground there's no way you can cover it all and so it was a, it was a taliban hot it was a known taliban hotspot area and so Fortu's job was to secure that village and so the ops company were going to go in and they would be they would, they'd be prepared to task was to basically create a checkpoint to be there for kind of six to eight weeks um whilst the the police then further to the north and east uh, were creating their checkpoints above this uh, canal so j company's job was well, in essence to draw the insurgents out of loy manda um in order to allow lima company to enter the village and kind of start setting up their checkpoint uh, as unhindered as possible and so i guess so for two commandos job was to lure the insurgents to their location for the brigade and J Company's job was to lure the insurgents to our location. So Lima, so we, it, it was, yeah, literally, I guess <laughs> the lads called it Op Tethered Goat, which <laughs> it's a classic. We all know, it, it, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's you're laughing because you know it is a classic tactic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, unfortunately, it worked, it worked very well, almost too well. Um, interestingly, actually, I had, a, I was having a conversation with someone who's a seer of a different unit uh, lit a few weeks ago and I've not seen him for years. He's now, you know, he'd left the Corps and he was telling me that he was back in the Brigade HQ and he was um, listening into the communication when we first went in on this op and apparently the Taliban from all the, the real bad guys just descended to our location. Um, and so, yeah, it was, yeah, we, Fortunately, we secured this temporary check. I identified with my intelligence officer a compound that would work for us that we could basically man for seven to ten days. It had you know decent size. We could get we were deployed with 112 guys. I had a 12 man IED team as well and 100 guys. So it was a big old big old deployment. You know we had kind of two or three Chinooks and four Merlin. You know all the attack helicopters go. It was a, it was a punchy kind of. And we were going in two days ahead of the brigade D Day. And one day ahead of Lima Company, who was going into the village. Um, <clears throat> the main concern initially was obviously coming under contact before we'd even got into this compound, because we were carrying a lot of kit. We knew it was going to be, um, we, we were kind of poking the hornet's nest. And so I'd, we doubled up on all ammunition scales, food, water, because I was told, look, you, we cannot guarantee that we're going to be able to resupply you within t in the first 24 hours. Because I'd say, look, within 24 hours, we're going to need this, this, you know, just as you know, just water and food. You know, you need six litres a man per day, just water. And then you've got the, you know, rations and everything else. Then you throw in ammunition. And I'd, I'd said to the guys, right, you need to double up on everything because, you know, we, we may not get resupplied and certainly in the first 24 48 hours and then you know we wanted to take in as much kit as we could uh, we, you know we get sandbags doesn't sound like much we start throwing it all in and then we had thermal imaging cameras on a massive try you know we kind of you know the guys are kind of you know, they use their initiative and you know some of my recce guys they'd kind of commandeered an eight meter signals mast and they'd made a way of attaching the thermal imaging camera so we could have this up high, you know, but all this kit weighs a bloody ton. This is the stuff you put on vehicles normally. So the Bergens were massive. And so I did not want to get contacted getting into the compound. Fortunately, we didn't. We secured it. And then throughout the day, we, we kind of came under sporadic fire. And, you know, 
I now real well, I realised later on that day they were, they were probing attacks. You know, these guys were well trained. They weren't your typical ten dollar Taliban. They knew what they were doing because the first one came from one area, the next one came from the opposite area, then ninety degrees the other way, and they were literally just kind of working out where we were, what you know, how we reacted. And then they left it till um, nightfall. So we probably had three or four kind of firefights during the day. And it, it was, you know, this was kind of been on the, you know, been in contact before, but these were these were punchy. They were different. And you know, one of them they got. Yeah, you know, we could because you know they knew what they were doing. They had little you know firing holes, doubled back, so they'd be behind three compound walls with you know firing point holes. So you know you just can't you can't get to them. And I actually li- literally had to bring in a. At one point where they got to the, the next, you know, kind of compound along, and it was only a, a, a strafing run from a jet that kind of stopped them getting any closer. You know, I couldn't drop anything else, and I had to call in a danger close gun run. Um, and so, you know, it was we were like, okay, yeah, these guys. Unfortunately, you know, we hadn't taken any casualties at this point, but they they kind of it was an eye opener. Then in the evening, then we got attacked again in darkness. Then you know they really are, you know, kind of know what they're doing. Um, and throughout throughout the day, they'd actually been obviously they'd been popping in um, uh, RPGs, rocket probe grenades, and underslung grenades. And they initially they'd, they'd fall short, then they'd go long, and then that evening, whack straight in the middle. You know, they'd kind of got their range and they knew what they're doing. And unfortunately, a, a couple of two or three guys had got DMV, and so we'd segregated them in an area because we didn't want the rest of the guys to kind of get ill. And one of the grenades landed right, you know, kind of in their area, so. They'd, <laughs> again um luckily it was minor fairly minor injuries and there was a, because there was a dust storm at bastion we couldn't get there so we we, we kind of <clears throat> silenced there the the attack and but then when we tried to get the the injured guys out uh the, they were like look we can't take off at bastion because they, they weren't cat cat a they could you know they, they weren't critical but you know they needed kazi vacking uh, one of them was actually the so we we taken in a det- detachment of um a uh, small, I don't even know what it's called now, UA, small UAV that they'd, you know, they'd launch from Bastion, but there's a guy with, a, again, this thing weighed about 50 kilos, this, this like kit. Her- Hermes, not Hermes. No, that's the bigger one, wasn't it? It was, it was kind of, you know, this, it was a maybe wingspan of a couple of meters, but it would, it would go kind of 20, 30 K. Oh. So it would be launched at Bastion um, and then controlled from this, by this guy, this, like, he was an artillery guy, I think. Um, and so it was, it was the one really decent bit of uh, integral um, uh, kit that I had that I could control. Whereas obviously UAVs up at ten thousand foot, that was my boss and above. And, you know, I couldn't say I want to go and look here. That was his job. And he got a bit of shrapnel in his neck, and I was like, Ooh, I kind of conv- I said, look, you know, kind of patched him up. I said, look, I really need you to stay. <laughs> stay. <laughs> so we got the helicopter in the next day to get out the other guys, but managed to convince him to kind of st- stay with us. Um, and then, over, over, then we kind of we kind of opened up. We started cl- clearing the firing positions from that the, the day before the, the next day, and started pushing out clearance patrols. And then um, we did a fighting patrol up to Loy Manda, where we could then link up with Lima Company. And so, the first couple of days had kind of gone alright. Unfortunately, we I think it was day three uh, during one of these clearance patrols. One of the guys got shot um, in the chest, and. It, we got him out and you know he's kind of he, he recovered but he was it was all kind of what you know as you know what we'd call fair play you know it was all it was fire fight it was all kind of like um you know, what, what you'd expect i suppose and then once the brigade uh mission had started there we started to push east into areas where we knew there was potential ied factory and so we were then we pushed out a couple of cases about five days into this op now, and we were probably we knew we'd be our job would be over, you no know, probably no longer than seven days. Um, but we were still drawing a lot of insurgents to our kind of our area. And on this, so the day before I got injured, we were we, I went out with uh, three multiples. So one multiple under Oli Augustin, he had his guys plus uh, the, the section of A and A. So he he kind of numbered about eighteen. Um, I had another multiple, which was about ten or twelve guys, and then a recce multiple that I had my uh, company TAC headquarters. So I took out myself, uh, my fire support team commander, so he could you know control artillery, etc., and his forward air controller, so we could talk to the jets. 
So that was just, yeah, my tack light. I just go very light, just the three of us. Uh, in fact, I didn't even take a signal on that. And so then I'd attach myself to my recce multiple, obviously for security, for all the electronic countermeasures, equipment and so on. So it was 45, 50 guys maybe. Um, so big enough that I wanted to be on the ground rather than staying in the temporary checkpoint because it was it's so much easier if you, you're actually in amongst it doing it rather than kind of, I'm very much lead from the front rather than from the, the, the back. You know, I'm not saying either way is the right way. That's how I like to do it and that's how I felt I kind of got respect to the guys. So we were we were patrolling out east, uh, you know, pepper pot in, you know, fire, not fire maneuver, but, you know, kind of as you do, one foot on the ground all the time. And it was going well. I think we'd, we'd probably been on the ground three hours, got to about midday. And we'd kind of said, right, we're going to go firm for a period. And, and each each multiple would kind of, you know, obviously secure the compound that they were in. And then guys could then kind of have a bit of a break because it's you know, 50 degrees, just moving a couple of K in that, certainly in an area where we knew it was, you know, something was probably going to happen. It was hard going. Um, and we were at that point we i'd gone firm with the recce multiple and we were in this compound and the guys there's like a, a small courtyard area and so i positioned myself there where i could see where my other multiples were in the other compounds a couple of other ollie's uh multiple were a couple hundred meters to my south and then rob my other multiple commander his were you know, a couple of hundred meters to the east and in between us all there was actually a taliban graveyard and we specifically avoided that because it was a you know a known area for potential ieds and um the the reports so we thought all these guys we thought they were in what was potentially the an old o and id factory and they'd they'd gone in secured it cleared it as you do put up sentries then called forward the rest of the guys to kind of man man it whilst they were going to take a break and it was actually, I think it was actually how the compound we were in, when the guy started searching it, found all sorts of stuff. And so it's probably our one that it might have been, you know, we don't know for sure because things suddenly kicked off and we couldn't kind of, um, you know, properly make the most of, you know, what, what was it, that what was there. Uh, basically, there's a you know, large explosion, you know, typical sound, that like crump that IED makes. And so I'm at this point, I've kind of got my back to a low compound wall and they're so they're directly behind me 200 meters behind me i'm sat next to my one of my stripes the recce multiple commander and so there's this explosion behind us i turn around to my left to look around to look around what's going on say to him right get the guys we're going to need to be you're going to move in any second um whilst i'm saying that i get on the radio you know contact id my lo location obviously we well, kind of knew that because i could see it and then there's an explosion where I am knocked off my feet and it's kind of dust and covered in crap and blood. And I was like, shit, who is it? Number off. Who, who's been hit? Who's been hit? Got everyone's numbering off. And I'm like, well, I said, well, it's got to be someone. Who is it? I'm covered, you know, covered in claret. Who's been hit? And then I remember the, F the FAC, she said, it's a goat. It's a fucking goat. And they looked up in the trees above us and this goat had plastered himself all over the place. <laughs> and I, so initially we were like, I thought we'd cut, you know, I thought this was a coordinated like RPG attack follow up from the IED. <laughs> the fucking goat set a, the IED off. The goat had set it off. <laughs> but this, and this thing, and we kind of looked down and it was literally where it was, it was just to the right of where we'd been sitting or, to, or actually closest to where, my, you know, Stripey Demo had been. He was, um, he was probably a meter to his right. And so he, he, fortunately, he went dead ahead, and I went left when the other ID had gone off to see what was going. He went into the compound to get his guys. I looked left to get kind of get eyes on what was going on. And, and the fucking was, goat and it, set it off. And the goat set it off to our right. Lucky. Yeah, massively. And so then, but then obviously, I'm then kind of like, you know, we're trying to Christ this, you know, and then we've got guys, and then then it starts coming through that you know look, got multiple casualties. Uh, you know, and the guy, it was, it was kicking off bid time. The ICOM chatter was off the charts. And so, you know, again, it's you know, basically we have a, you know, each multiple has an interpreter. They carry a radio. And so we can listen into Taliban communications. And the radio is called the ICOM, yeah. Yeah. And, and, so, and then they can report back what's being said. And um, my interpreter, you know, he kind of, he's, he's like, oh, yeah, Major Steve, Major Steve, you know, the, 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 they're saying they're going in to finish them off. They're going in to finish them off. And then we could, and then, 
on his, my interpreter's radio, I've, I've then got reports from, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, tragically, my troop commander, Ollie, he, he'd he been se severely injured, later died. Uh, one of his Marines, uh, Sam Alexander, who, you know, he'd, he'd won an MC on a previous tour, a uh, quality guy. Uh, my company medic, Cass Little, he'd, he'd been injured. Uh, another one of the Marines, JJ, had been injured. Interpreter had taken a hit, who later went on and died. And another, and so this was a, you know, this was a, a serious blast. And basically, the, the the Afghan army that were with them just legged it. And so the multiple there it was, it was you know, corporal left. You know, Ollie's two IC was a corporal. Um, you know, they only had, they only had a handful of guys because half of them had been fucking decimated from this blast. And so. You know, this I talk now. You know, this was all you know, matter of you know, tens of seconds, minutes. This was all obviously happening very quick. But at the same time, these guys initially were having to deal with this kind of devastation. You know, cast the med. You know, his med bergen had been incinerated. So there was no med kit. Um, the guys also. So then, on our on the, my interpreter's radio, I then start hearing the screams of the guys that have been injured. Oh. And so I'm like, oh, shit, they are literally about to storm the compound um and so and then we're kind of like thinking right we're in a compound that's obviously got ieds in and so i've we, we just you know i've been knocked off my feet with this id trying to control what's going on thinking well i'm not gonna i'm knelt here i'm not gonna move for the time being because we know what's going so then i'm like right we need to start clearing a path that although we've cleared in we need to clear out again because you know as you do is you can't get every ied you're gonna miss them in the end of the day, it's just a metal detector trying to pick up some metal batteries or wires, and they always remote them. Well, they were starting to remote batteries from the IDs, and so I knew that it was going to take us a good few minutes to get to them. And so I looked across to Rob Driscoll, who's in command of the other multiple, and I remember about to get on the radio, and I was going to have to, I was going to have to say to him, "Right, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go across that Taliban graveyard." and get to them because we are we are literally we're having to kind of get out of this compound before we can get across there and as i went on the radio to say he came on the net and was like right i'm going we're moving out and i see him line his guys up outside the compound and they just go for it um so fortunately they got there pretty quickly and he had another navy medic with him who was excellent excellent and you know the the, the guys um who initially deal with the situation um you know they did an amazing job trying to kind of you know, when you think i remember you know once they'd kind of got some morphine in Cass and jake you know they're having to say, look we're gonna have to leave you now and go and sort out these other guys that are far worse than you just keep screaming um you know if you're screaming we know you you you're still you're still around but there's other guys that are worse off and they had to go and kind of do what they could for for sam and ollie and um abdullah the interpreter Oh, the turp got whacked as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And late, he later on died in hospital. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, Sam and Ollie were not in a good way. And, you know, the, the guys continued, you know, giving battlefield first aid until um, it was a Pedro's American helicopter came in in the end because, it was, you know, it was a hot, hot area. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, they, they, they were dead from there. You know, we, we cannot obviously declare anyone dead because we're not doctors. Only a doctor can do that. But they, they were in a, you know, a really bad way. Mm. Um, and then Abdullah died, yeah, the interpreter died in, in Camp Bastion. Uh, JJ and Cass got back. JJ, uh, Cass had, uh, had a leg blown off uh, as of a leg was kind of fairly gnarly, <clears throat> kind of, I think he lost, kind of, He's got it back, but he kind of fractured eye socket. His eye was out, you know, all sorts of stuff. You know, for JJ had looked like he'd basically been sandblasted. You know, just you know, it was this basically the ID. They were in a, an archway of this compound, and you know, had kind of had metal doors either side, and you know, had been cleared with the with the the Valon metal detectors. Um, but because of the arch, the, the IED, I kind of reverberate, you know, it, it obviously finds the path of least resistance, which was kind of sideways out of this. And so the guys, um, based on either end of the arch, you know, so JJ was on one end, he kind of based, it was almost like he was being stoned, I guess, just by house bricks at a kind of rapid rate. And his, his flesh was ripped from him. He just looked a mess. Um, but actually, he was one of the ones that was, you know, not, not as bad as the other guys. Anyway, we, you know, we kind of, um, 
got them out. The Pedros came in, and I, I think, I think the fact that we had enough manpower there, there was no further, there were no further attacks because we, all we were waiting for was the next kind of next attack to kind of follow in. But I think by that point we had, I had a you know every asset was kind of turned to me you know, when you suddenly get mass casualty situation. Um, you know, I did have everything on call from you know predators to Apaches to jets to whatever we need. You know, I think the noise and the the number of I think they probably surprised that I we kind of suddenly popped up with another thirty forty odd guys was enough that they didn't try and kind of get, go in and you know finish them off. Thankfully, then, you know those were left from that, that multiple. So once we got the you know the, the dead and injured. Um, Kazivak back to Bastion. There's a period, you know, kind of take stock. I remember my CEO coming up on the net and saying, right, you need to go firm, secure the area because we've got the high readiness force coming in to try and exploit what's gone on. So the high readiness force were uh, counter IED specialists, um, but they were there also to, to take forensics to try and kind of get as much information and evidence from the scene to start picturing IED, you know, they, they could actually start, you know, identifying IED makers because they'd leave fingerprints they, the way they'd build them. And the, the brigade were pretty keen that um, they came in. I was like, look, you know, it's now kind of, I don't know what it was, two, two, in the, two three in the afternoon. You know, it was getting darker. And I said, we've got 2K to get back. We've got to patrol back. I don't want to be doing that. Like I said, you know, we need to be out of here no later than 1800. <laughs> Because they said that the high readiness force wouldn't be flown in till about kind of half four five. Oh, okay. So we secured the area, um, and you know you got, got you know the place was a mess as you can imagine. You know, br- broken kit, weapons, body parts. Guys were in a mess because you know, they just seen their best mates blown apart. They just done all they can to you know it was it was, and so there were guys that were shaken. So we kind of got them off to the side. Um, uh, secured the, the actual compound itself, and I basically stopped anyone out. Anyone that didn't need to go in, we kept them out because we just didn't need guys seeing things that they didn't need to see. Um, and started kind of, you know, issuing out the, the bits of kit and stuff that was left over, you know, because there was, you know, assault ladders and bergens and weapons all broken apart and radio kit and all this stuff we had to salvage and start giving to each all the other guys because we couldn't leave it behind um body parts as well and uh so and it got to about five o'clock and i was like right if these don't turn you know we, anyway the, the, the high readiness force landed on and i spoke to the oc officer commanding and um he was like oh so what's the, you know we've, we've given a brief before we left and they were they were fairly nervous because they'd known what had gone on the previous five days they knew they were in a fairly punchy area and they were quite kind of like all a bit like and i said look well look you know, you've got to go in and do your thing. And here you go. And I started walking towards you. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to show you where it went off. And went, no, no, we've got to clear a path into the compound. And I said, right. I said, I, did. I was like, we've been walking around this whole thing for the last three hours. Um, was it a bit naive? Well, the problem was we'd, we thought we'd already secured it. We clearly had it. It's what, how many, you know, you could probably go into a compound and secure it three or four times, clear it for IEDs, but actually still miss one. But they, he was obviously doing it by the book. And so he started at the gate um, and it was like 25, 30 meters before you even got to the archway where this had gone off. And I was like, Christ, this is good. You know, I said, look, we need to be out of 1800 because they'd also been told that they were going to have to come back with us to our temporary checkpoint. So they're going to have to patrol back with us. So they were shit themselves about that um, and stay a night and then get flown out the next day. And so there I said, look, we're leaving at six. That's it. You've got to you know, do work quickly fair play incredibly he kind of you know it was on his belly he cleared a you know cleared a, another a new route in uh all the way up there exploited the actual explosion site he identified where and at, with the uh, the wires that actually so the battery pack was actually off out the arch round the corner and then down buried down the side of a compound wall and he said he'd seen it before he said he'd so he the good thing was that he'd actually recognised this type of tactic. The way the way the wires had been kind of dug in, the way they'd followed compound walls, and the fact that they were they were probably what, eight meters away, okay. and you know, out the archway, <coughs> along a wall, buried down in the ground, was a battery pack. And so, it, 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 there's no way you can clear every inch of a compound. 
um, and they knew what they, you know they, they kind of they knew what they were doing and but I was I remember thinking that's good effort to have, and so you know and they got the forensics and so on and I was like right it was like five plus six or whatever it was pretty you know, just after I was like right we're going we need to get moving so we start patrolling back we split we, we kind of break back down into multiples you know what's left of ollies kind of we attach them to robs and then i think i had the high readiness force with myself and the recce multiple we went back into two files um and i remember got literally 100 meters from the temporary checkpoint and rob comes up on the radio and he's like i can see a there's a leg hanging in a tree like we're on about he said i can see a leg hanging in a tree and i'm immediately thinking I can't be aware from what we've done because we, we ensured there was no body parts left around in the compound. And she's so like, I'm going to go and get it. I said, right, stop, go firm. It's a booby trap. Stop, 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 stop. And as, as we said that, then there was grenades and um, oh, machine gun fire where he was. And so they were ambushed and it was basically, it was a come on. And so then we get it. I get into the compound and then the, uh, the temporary checkpoint comes under attack as well. So I've now, and the problem was for the, where Rob and his guys were, they were going to, they were going to have to kind of almost withdraw under contact into where we were having to kind of repel from another attack. And so then I suddenly had this kind of like serious concern for blue on blue. Uh, again, fortunately, because of what had gone on, we had loads of assets. Um, and so we actually had a predator and they we put a couple of hellfire from predator into where the um, machine gun fire where they were ambushed from uh, at the same time and i remember i remember i can remember seeing his guys pepper you know awesome withdrawing <coughs> under contact drills pepper pot you know the kind of jungle drills going down this irrigation ditch awesome drills and then we were having to move sweeping fire as our guys were kind of literally firing in front of them it was all and you know there was i think i'm not going to say it was, it was it was all down to me there was a lot of luck that we didn't have a blue and blue there was so much going on we had artillery as well at, sorry not artillery mortars firing in um, it was, you know, it was a big old situation. And amazingly, thankfully, no one was injured. And and whilst they were withdrawing out, he managed to actually grab this leg. Um, was so it, was it what, one of the legs from your guys? No, it turned tragically. It turned out to be uh, the leg from a, a at Lima Company, a lad from Lima Company who'd been killed two weeks earlier, about five k away. Jesus Christ! And so I know, and it was one of those things where I thought at the time thank god i you know because that's that's what's the kind of that's what they were doing you know and this this story has been told by a few people before um i've heard it yeah okay yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's um as in other people's story you know maybe it's been done it was used but it, that's the kind of you know the levels they they'd go to um and you know so we, we get back in there's you know it's by now it's been a lot you know it was our definite our longest day so to speak um got to about midnight and you know the CEO tells you about you, you need to write you know you start thinking about eulogies and all this kind of stuff uh you got to brief the lads there's guys that were like still covered in blood kind of you know not in a good way saying right i need to get out of here you need to get me out of here you know they dealt with some pretty horrific stuff that day uh and you're told i remember saying all right burn your burn your uniform get on your one spare set of uniform you know just you know hunker down you know because a, we need you here, and B, I'm not calling a helicopter to get you kind of repatriated f for a number of reasons I won't even go into. But what, you know, one, you don't want to be, the, you know. And anyway, so it gets to the, the next day, and you know, you patrol, you've got to go on, your patrols have got to go out again. Crack on, you've got to crack on. Crack on, yeah. Um, and you know, the, the guys that uh, that were in a bad way, they they'd kind of, they, you know, they, they were really good. They'd kind of sorted out their heads you know and i'd said to them look i'm not going to make you ground patrol today but you know i need you here to be you know ready to defend the, the temporary checkpoint because we'd already come under attack numerous times i said but look i won't you know make you go out on the ground and so we went out so in the end i said right i said to again rob and damo um right you know we need to go out again and so a couple of multiples two stripes I didn't need to go out because you know I, that yeah that could have easily been led by them, but this this was definitely me thinking right I you know I'm going to lead from the front Le it, yeah yeah this yeah, is me I'm going to you know kind of yeah. I think the guys respected that 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 fact it was you know blokes did not want to go out that gate 
Yeah, and that is the, 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 a prime example of the situation where you've got to do it. Exactly. Do and it you know, I remember my company to ICU, who's back in, um, you know, our, our patrol base. He's still, le- you know, he's still, he's kind of running what's left of the company. Uh, half, you know, you know, good eighty odd guys, and all the checkpoints, the patrols going on back there. He's running with all that, you know, day to day business, ground holding is is, is still ongoing. And uh, I remember him saying to me, "So look, you don't you don't need to go on this." And I said, "I know you're right." And my company intelligence officer, who I'd taken with me forward, um, he said, he, "To be fair, all, <laughs> all him and my fire support team commander." But particular fire support team gone. He didn't want to go. I, he said they were like, you, "You don't need to go out." I said, "I know I don't." However, we've had a shitty few days, particularly <coughs> crap day yesterday. Uh, guys don't want to go out, um, and therefore, you know, it's kind of it's it's what I want to do. I want to lead by example. Um, and so I said, so I said to my FST commander, I said, "Sorry, that means you're coming, and you, <laughs> uh, FAC." Um, Bob, bomb, bombardier. Obviously, was his rank, but I always used to call him Bob. <laughs> Bob Flynn, bombardier Flynn, Bob Flynn. So always, anyway, um, and uh, so we deployed it again. I, I, I attached the three of us to wrecking multiple, and we went out, you know, to, with the, the two multiples um, back into the, the same area because uh, we still had to kind of, you know, certainly I wanted to go back to the, the the compound where we'd been in that we'd had to leave quickly because, again, I wanted to kind of, you know, see if we can gather further evidence from what was going on there. Uh, th- there was clearly a very different atmosphere going back into that area, as you can imagine. Um, atmosphere, what, with your group or with the... No, no, sorry. With, yeah, so, I mean, there, there weren't, there were hardly any civvies around this area anyway. <clears throat> um, what were definitely had, had kind of disappeared now. And you know we we knew we were being watched, uh, dickers as we call them. Um, uh, we we get about two two and a bit hours in, we came under contact, and it was heavy machine gun fire. And I as I remember literally we got into this ditch, and I was literally kind of getting as much as I could in uh, into the water. And I was like worried that although I had obviously my radio in a waterproof bag, and my, I was like Christ, I was trying to remember trying to keep the radio out of the water, and we was we were all kind of like this is sustained machine gun fire and it turned out i think it was actually i mean it's all by the by now i think it was actually from a, a battle group to our east because it's, it was like i was like this is a sustained and b very much like gpmg fire what, were I, the rounds landing in and around you oh yeah yeah we were literally on our belt buckles um and so because i remember either i either remember saying god get on the neck it's coming from i'm because i, I because we, we were in an ops box. We'd be given an ops box to operate in what was the tri-boundary area. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking it's coming from, I can't remember the name of the checkpoint. There was a checkpoint that was kind of, I guess they're northern, but I think it was the Scots. I can't remember which, which battle group it was. Um, I, I don't know because a load of shit went on the rest of the day and it, it, it was what it was. I mean, fortunately, you know, I remember it, I remember me getting on the net saying, I'm sure we're coming under fire from our own, you know, just get it up the net. This is us here. This is us, you know, operating in this area. They shouldn't be firing into an ops box anyway. Um, but it was like, I was like, Christ, this is, yeah, pucker. Um, refine, and I was like, we swung around and I thought, actually, you know what? Uh, we're not going to go to the compound. We've, we've been, by this point, we've been out three hours. Um, we're going to head back. We'll, we'll do it the next day or whatever. Um, and so we were patrolling back. And I was probably I was probably seventh in line in the patrol. You know, usual five meter spacings between each 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 bloke. And we we went and a couple of in, well, they turn out to be insurgents, but you know, a couple of Afghans clearly you know kind of looking suspicious. And I remember looking at them through my scope because they were a good few hundred meters away. And I think they're just they're definitely following. They're definitely reporting back. Um, but you know until they pose an imminent threat to you or someone else, there's nothing you can do about it. And I remember uh, walking into this irrigation ditch, so you always, you know, you always avoid the vulnerable points, which the crossing points. So you kind of, you know, you you, you choose the, the hardest terrain to go through because in theory it's the, the most unlikely place that they're going to plant an IED. Although they obviously got used to those tactics as well because they'd realised that we would avoid the crossing points. And this is what they'd done in this situation. So I was probably about, we're about five meters down. So if you can imagine there's an irrigation ditch running across our frontage that we have to go across. The crossing point's five meters to my right. I'm now in the bottom of the irrigation ditch. It's probably about three, three foot deep. 
and about a foot, foot and a half of water in the bottom of it. Crossing points to my right. And then suddenly, that you know, there's an enormous explosion. I remember the explosion. And I remember hitting, the, you know, being knocked hard to the floor, like even hit by a car. And then because of the day before, I remember thinking, fuck, you know, someone, you know, I was like, I remember, again, time did, it sounds cliche, time did slow down. Um, Because what happened next was probably a second, if that, a couple of seconds. But it felt like, um, you know, it was quite a long period. And I remember remember initially thinking someone else has been hit. Uh, And I remember um, then... I do. I remember hearing some. I heard someone say, "Ah, oh, my legs!" And so I thought, "Okay, somebody's been blown up, lost their legs. I'm in the periphery." And then I went to kind of uh, move, and then the pain hit me like a sledgehammer, and it felt like someone had kind of basically got a large implement and driven it through my chest. And I couldn't feel my legs, and then I went to breathe, and it was, it was, it was, there was just this kind of bizarre you're on your back at this point uh i'm on my side and so i'm in the water and and so i'm trying i remember half my face is kind of in the water and i'm just like and each time i go to breathe my mouth's out the water but there's this like kind of big noise coming from my chest area um i was like you know you're thinking this is not good and i can't couldn't feel my legs and i thought actually shit it's me i've been here and so and then so all this is just kind of as me i'm trying to then actually get kind of air into me i could i could wiggle my toes and i thought okay so i've got my legs there's something i've got there's something else going on here uh and then and then there's this um uh my fst commander kind of crawls into the ditch and so this is probably within you know fairly rapidly 10 20 seconds i don't know and it was him who'd shouted about his legs and he'd got some shrapnel in his legs, but he'd then crawled into the ditch because he'd seen it was me who'd taken the brunt. And so then he's, and I'm like kind of, by this point, I'm in you know proper shit situation. He's trying to like get my head out of the water because I'm then sort of like, you know, almost drowning as well as kind of got this massive sucking chest wound. Um, but he can't, you know, he's he's got, you know, shrapnel in his lower leg, so he can't kind of, he can't shift me. And I remember the guys then kind of saying, right, don't move, we're coming back. We're coming. I was like, I can't fucking move anywhere anyway. <laughs> but, but I kind of, and then one of the, the stripe, you, sh- you know, go firm, secondary devices. And initially I was like, oh sh- shit, they're going to take a while until they get here. But then I thought, good drills actually, that's really good drills. And I could hear them kind of clearing a path to me because they, you know, weren't, weren't sure if there's going to be other, other devices. And so then the first couple of guys got there, dragged me out of the ditch um and then yeah start doing the old battlefield first aid meanwhile then um so the forward air controller he then calls in a show of force because we then have we had a jet on on station and uh well, i can't remember the round, it's all, it's all, uh, then we come under con the rounds going down um and so then Rob's maneuvering his guys around. And so this is where I suppose, obviously I'm still trying to kind of control things. And actually I'm, I'm not controlling anything. <laughs> They're just telling me to shut the fuck up. And uh, Ford Air Controller, Bob, as I call him, he brought in this. And that was, I suppose that's the first big thing I remember was this, the, the noise and heat and this jet. And the, the lads have since told me they have never seen a jet come in so low and so he's on the net and the, the jet the pilots actually said to him um i've just seen an explosion down in your you know what you know is it in your and he's like ah, it's my sun ray my sun ray's been hit we you know we need a show of force immediately and so this jet comes in and they were like literally it was like scraping the compounds and i remember it was like a bloody earthquake this thing and it kind of roared over uh one of my stripes put a couple of 40 mils into where the guys had set off the i anyway we, they basically neutralized the threat secured the area started working on me by this point i suppose i am i suppose i am uh, there, there's a point where the pain disappears and i suppose it was well i can't remember every little thing so i suppose i told a bit of a lie earlier but the um there's, there's definitely a point where uh it, yeah the pain disappears and you know, it starts to kind of, I start to get the old tunnel vision and it's, 
again yeah this this also sounds cliched but i you know i i came to terms with dying there was um you know i'm not a religious person but this yeah was definitely me accepting my fate um and i only mention that because having gone through that uh situation and come out the other side it um it i look at life in a very different way i live life in a d- very different way I, d- I certainly live for the moment i don't go around doing stupid crazy things but i you know, i am aware of how fragile life is and the fact that i came to terms with literally you know i properly thought this is it um in hindsight i may have just been going unconscious i don't know because i remember the guy as you know you don't you know you make sure guys don't go to sleep because that is their body sick shutting down and so they're slapping me around the face don't go to sleep don't go to sleep and then then you can hear the old sound of the chinook coming in and that was you know, proper reassuring because you know if you're gonna if you get on board the chinook you've got a whatever it is i think it got it to about 95 90 i don't know the statistic but it's high if you get on that chinook then you've got a really strong chance of surviving and we know that you know guys with you know serious triple amps all sorts of you know, guys have survived some serious shit and so hearing that i then was like okay i'm gonna make it. i remember that i do remember vividly thinking okay i'm gonna make it i'm gonna be all right um and yeah i remember being stretched on and it's another comedy moment so yeah, it's just a bivy bag so there's four guys on each corner uh they've secured the hls the mert lands on and it's actually cheeky actually one of my stripes had said it was when he first called in the the medivac he'd said it was a he would said it he was like because he knew that we needed a mert he, he kind of basically said it it was clear when it wasn't fortunately by the time it landed it was it was clear and uh they landed on anyway as, as the guys are running along obviously the ramp comes down you've got the door gunner there with the the gpmg in the center of the ramp obviously the blokes are just yeah, kind of like charging f- on and next thing basically they 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 as you do run on either side of the gpmg when you got you're they, in the middle i'm in the middle on this <laughs> stretch <laughs> biffy. and the four and they charge up and it smashed me into the gpmg i think dog was like what the fuck are you doing um so i didn't get this gpmg to the back of the head but to be honest that's the least of my worries and i remember being dumped in the back of the chinook um and so this was my last kind of um uh, conscious thought or moment of sight uh the this guy kind of low over me had an air crew helmet on it said doctor across the top and i remember shouting put me to sleep please put me to sleep put me to sleep and he let over he said this is gonna hurt but you'll be all right and then he drilled ketamine into me and bosh that was me uh then in three weeks then i was out of it in really? a coma yeah what were the injuries <laughs> so i'd i'd taken uh so uh working from but it was all down the right hand side directional fragmentation charge charge set off by these guys um i'd taken shrapnel to the lower calves uh was it fib tib patella broken wiped the cartilage out of my right knee bottom of my femur big hole in my top of my feet leg um what it, it, it wiped what the, say say again but the femur Oh, no, so so basically, yeah, a load of shrapnel had like wiped the cartilage out of out of my. So it broke, yeah, a fib tib patella femur, uh, cartilage. I only say the cartilage because that's one of my issues now. You broke the femur, yeah, bottom. Yeah. The end. To be fair, it wasn't kind of through the centre. Although it's bizarre, this massive it hole. Doesn't in, make it any better. No, I had this massive hole in my right leg. Like serious. This kind of. I'm, what am I saying? That what's that? Four inches wide, three inches diameter. A big, a big old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Six inches, yeah, well. uh, big old hole, and amazing. It didn't break it anyway. And then, but the uh, it's got some arm injuries, like kind of nearly severed the older nerve, a few bits. But the, the, what was the, the bad injury was I had a massive hole in my chest, right hand side, uh, fractured load of ribs, tore my chest apart, lung, all sorts of bit, a shitload of crap in there. Uh, and you can almost straight basically, I, I was in a position where a bit of a uh, a kind of a running position, you know, I had I, as I was, I was stepping out of the irrigation ditch. And so I had my arm, my right arm to the back. And so what had happened, the the blast had gone through, the, the, the side plate had done its job, got nothing there, lower kind of lower chest area, but where the Kevlar, you know, the, the, the body armor, it blown through the body armor and put a big hole in basically under my armpit. And then I've got this big hole in my leg at, at the top, you know, I saw it's kind of three inch diameter hole, two, two inch, I'm exaggerating. 
and then my legs clear where I have my pistol pistol took a load of the blood and it's my low and so you can kind of see the bits that kind of save body parts by my pistol the plate um and uh anyway they by the time they got me to bastion uh they um you know put me through the ct scanner and they sort of like okay chest injuries what we need to deal with that's what's life-threatening so they cut me open that's the microphone moving uh right across my back so kind of from my spine through to my armpit um split the rib cage and they went in and basically to try and find out what was going on internally and i think apparently i've been told i do actually have photos as well i managed to get my photos from the slab from bastion that's rare yeah you do well you can you can actually there is a way of under freedom of information getting them GDP, gdpr yeah <laughs> Oh, it was before that came in, but yeah, before similar that, yeah. thing, yeah. And um, so they'd, uh, yeah, they, they, they apparently they dug out body armor, <clears throat> shrapnel, stones, clothing, mud, all sorts of Milang. shit from my chest cavity. Yeah, it'd gone right in. And they, uh, the surgeons were like, okay, stabilize me as best they can. They thought, you know, we're just going to staple them together, keep them in a coma, and send them back to the UK and let them deal, deal with me, basically. And so I was, next day back in the uk uh queen elizabeth hospital birmingham but by, the time, by the time i got back there i think my body was riddled with infections i'm on a ventilate you know ventilate you know breathing for me and all and all sorts and um and so because of that situation they just they kind of kept having to do little life-saving type ops apparently and th- these are only things i found out much later on i remember that apparently there was a time where i actually d- died in intensive care but they didn't tell my family Clearly, they didn't want to because I survived. Really? Well, it was, it was bizarre. I was actually at JJ Chalmers' his, um, his wedding, and there was a consultant there. Was JJ the other guy in the ground were you? He he got injured the day before. That's, oh, that's the guy you were talking about. You said JJ. Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, JJ Chalmers. I did, I did that. I did yeah, yeah. And my fire support team commander was called JJ as well. Got injured with me. He got um, basically some shrapnel on his lower legs. He ended up he, getting flown back with me on the same plane. I mean, tell he was so I'm in a coma on the the. the uh, is it cast Yeah, they, they, you know the the, the, the big C seventeen surgical aeroplane, and I'm out of it, and he's kind of like you know kind of in a bed, can't obviously get out of it, but is like wide awake and charmers. No, this is now JJ. Your, this is now my fire sports yeah, team right, commander, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was it was a nightmare because he was strapped down, and we were stuck in Cyprus apparently on the on the runway for a few hours, and he was just like it took forever to get back to the UK. And he said, yeah, there was a, a slight moment where he wished he was in my position, kind of unconscious, but then that soon disappeared. <laughs> he actually made it out to the back end of the tour as well. He did the last few weeks. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, yeah, back, back to uh, back to QE. And uh, they, they, they basically just kept me on life support because on a ventilator, because my body was just kind of getting riddled with infection. <clears throat> And getting worse and worse, and they thought I think I wouldn't survive another kind of major operation to start digging stuff out of my chest. Um, but I wasn't kind of healing. I was getting, but the infection was kind of taking hold. But at the same time, my body, you know, didn't want to kind of breathe for itself. I was on a ventilator at this point, and so they they tried something apparently fairly revolutionary at the time, using an oscillator, which is a different type of breathing machine. They normally use it for, for infants, and uh that, that basically it, rather than whether a ventilator will still breathe so you you know your, your chest will still move your lungs will still inflate and deflate um problem is with that it's hard for then you know if you've got serious internal damage for it to heal because it's being kind of inflated and deflated and all this movement going on so whereas an oscillator i don't know how it works but it, it keeps your you kind of at a, a constant pressure so there's no kind of chest movement it's just it's, and it's, it kind of makes a bizarre noise it's just like a which just constantly circulate the same amount of air through the whole time yeah and, yeah okay got yeah yeah and so they put me on one of those thinking let's see if that works and um, i think yeah amazingly after uh, i don't know i spent i can't remember the, the figure five days a, a, a while on it they then brought me back to a ventilator and then they they my, i started showing signs of um you know kind of recovering uh, so yeah it ended up being nearly three weeks in a in a in, induced coma um I, I tell you what and actually the hallucinations and nightmares from that coma are worse than being blown up were you awake then uh, so conscious were you conscious in that yeah coma? so this is what they call it's it's called intensive care psychosis and a lot of guys go through it well, well, be- well we spoke with yourself so I, I'm, I, I'm i'm gonna mention it so cause i mentioned it at the start of the podcast chris shirley yeah, who's ex bootleg officer? So right now, unfortunately, Chris is in an induced coma because of a mountaineering accident. So this is interesting to hear. Yeah, and it, and actually, it's probably something you should 
yeah, he, his mind at the moment will be playing all sorts of tricks with him. Um, and so, and you know, actually, it's probably something where we should get probably message to his missus. You know, it, it might even go back to his, his Afghan times and stuff like that. Well, I'm, I'm gonna after we get off this, I swear yeah. I'll, I'll drop our message. You come out, you, you come when you come out of the cut. You, you, your brain basically just starts doing all sorts of things. So, 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 if, for example, if I give you an example, when I came out of the coma, um. I was adamant that I had been captured by the Taliban and been tortured in Kazakhstan and eventually escaped and made it to the hospital and then repatriated. And, you know, I was literally kind of telling everyone this story. Oh, I said I couldn't talk because I had a tracheotomy. And so, but, but I kind of remember trying to explain this situation and I'm still bed, you know, I couldn't move much, but I, I was just, and I, they're like, you haven't, you didn't, that wasn't the case. I was like, well, you know, I was absolutely, and it was only when I was actually a few weeks later telling uh, this story where I was talking to a consultant saying, well, I vividly remember uh, being tortured. I remember being strapped down. I remember being used for propaganda. And I remember thinking, right, if if I'm going, I'm going to take one of them with me. <clears throat> and I managed to break three of these restraints and I start strangling this guy. And that's kind of all, all I remember of that. That, But it's so real. You know, obviously, you look back and you think, well, yeah, but then the, the the dream or hallucination disappears. So why don't you? But at the time, your brain it, it, you can smell, you can feel heat, everything. My friend, uh, my friend Josh, who had a his ex. Oh, he was a bootneck as well. Josh Pelland, a bootneck. Pel- yeah, Josh Pelland. Yeah, he he talked about so he had a nasty um, climbing accident, yeah. paralyzed, and um, he spoke about when he was when he came round. It was for, I think it was for two weeks. He thought he'd been captured by the Taliban, yeah. and he was in, and they had to restrain him. He thought he thought it constantly. And he was still on the drugs. It's, it's crazy, yeah. isn't it? And so, and so when I was explaining this to the consultant, he went, "Ah, oh, yeah, that mm, that, that explains." I said, "What explains what?" And he said, "Well, we we were doing a routine operation, so they were inserting a pick line. So they'd, um, it's basically yeah, just they they put a feeder tube in your arm down into your heart, so they can basically you know take blood, give blood." In, get drugs but immediately um, and so you, you've got this this line that goes yeah straight into your body and so it's a, it's a routine op but apparently yeah, I'm in a coma so they don't need to put me asleep for this but obviously the anaesthetist is monitoring it and uh, mid operation apparently <coughs> I open my eyes I then rip the ventilator tube out of my throat pull all the lines out of my neck and start strangling the anaesthetist oh my god and um and so, uh, and and there's all oh, I punched a nerve, all sorts of stuff. And there's things I remember being back on patrol. I'd I'd recovered. I'd, I knew I'd been in my brain. It said you've been injured, but you've recovered. You're back out with the lads. Albeit I was back out in the original checkpoint. You know, clearly the time frames wouldn't work, but it's so real. And then this is the crazy. And then, but I was able to hover so that the IED threat didn't hit me. I could, whenever, whenever we went out on patrol, <laughs> I know we can laugh about it now, I'd be a foot off the ground. <laughs> but that was, I was like completely like real. And then there was these contact. And then I had another one where I was, I'd been moved to a private hospital in Switzerland. And it was like mega Gucci. And, uh, I remember thinking, and there were, and, um, the, uh, I found out that the way they would make uh, were making their money was that they were filming all the patients, uh, and I, and ba- basically being changed and you know wiping them whenever you know because you know you're in a coma you still got to shit and, and all those things you know you have a catheter in but you know stuff still goes on you still have to be looked after for the nurses, and so in, in somehow, but yeah you know, I'd got it into my head that they were selling this these kind of like. <laughs> weirdo kind of videos and that's how they made their money and i did one, one quite quite sad one actually the um i remember saying oh there's one where i'd i'd been moved to a fairground I'd, i was again i was in kazakhstan uh in a tented hospital and uh there's a military welfare liaison officer and he said like we're, we're flying out your your wife and kids to see you and i was like what that's fucking crazy why are you flying them out it's too dangerous but i was like, really excited about seeing my kids in that and they said, oh, we're going we're gonna to take you in your bed to a fairground so it's not so, you know, scary for your kids. All crazy stuff, but in your head, totally, you know, realistic. Um, and I remember waiting at this fairground in my hospital bed all day. I'm like, when are they going to turn up? When are they, oh, they're going to be here. They're going to be here. And they eventually turn up. 
and they kind of walk towards me. They get they get within a meter of me, and then they're like, "Oh no, you've got to go now." And I didn't I couldn't didn't get to touch them, and I it's quite bizarre. And I remember telling my what now my ex wife, but I remember telling my wife that story, and she was like, "Oh, that might have been when." And so it, there was a time where they thought it was like touch and go, and obviously kids aren't allowed in intensive care normally. But they said to my wife and my mum, um, "You know, you can carry the kids in to see him." Um, and they said, but you've got to stay a metre back from the bed. Don't, you know, don't because they didn't want obviously, the kids to get infected. Or, you know, they're worried about the kids, not me. Um, and so we thought that's probably, and basically what it is, so you're on these drugs to keep you in the induced coma, but you're not completely out of it. And so there is still a bit of brain activity. And as your body gets used to the drugs, obviously you start to come out of this induced coma. And so often, apparently, you know, my mum or my you know, my ex-wife would be my bedside and they would say, you know, daily, your eye, my eyes would open. I'd look around and they'd be like, oh, my God, you know, and then you know, kind of this, what's happening is you are, you're coming out of the coma and your brain takes on the surroundings and turns it into something completely else fucked up. Um, but because, and this happens, you know, it could be, it could be in a car accident and similar thing, but because you know the military you, you've come from such a high threat environment where on a daily basis your life is in danger the brain is just t- totally kind of on, on alert and turns those kind of surroundings into something that basically people are trying out to get you they're there to kill you and so yeah it was, it was horrendous how long, how long did it take to fully recover <coughs> So yeah, I had three weeks coma, a couple of weeks in intensive care, and then once I got on the ward, I started making quite a quick, re- fairly good recovery. So it's two, three months in hospital, then to Headley Court, and then that's when your kind of rehab starts in earnest. Um, but because I had a load of shrapnel, so they never they never cut me open again in the chest, but they just knew there was a load of shrapnel in there. So I, during my rehab, I was having to have a CT scan every four weeks to kind of monitor the shrapnel. And uh, one of the consultants, he said to me, he'd done a bit of research. He looked at, you know, Vietnam, Korea, and the blast injuries to the chest. And they were trying to find examples of, you know, what had happened to people with shrapnel in their chest. And I'd had, like, I had a piece 20 mil wide, two millimeters from my pulmonary artery. I had bits in, in my lung. Lung was torn apart, but, it, you know, there was a shrapnel in there. It was all over the place. I wasn't allowed my heart rate to go above 120 because they didn't, they didn't want my heart beating against this piece of shrapnel. But they were kind of thinking, well, let's see if it scars over and just becomes part of my body. Was the kind of they, they were they, they didn't know it was kind of uncharted territory basically because no one had survived that type of chest injury blast injury to the chest. Um, and uh, so I was having these CT scans every four weeks, and the, yeah, rehab was kind of progressing. You know, I found it I actually found it quite tough though because I was you know I was I had all my limbs. I was known as a four limmer at Headley Court, um, but, but yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, you, you, single amputee is kind of, oh, you just got a scratch. Double amputee, you know, fairly, you know, triple amputee, they were the daddies. It's unusual for an able bodied person to be discriminated against, right? <laughs> <I> mean, it <laughs> was exactly like that. four limbers. Um, and, and what made it worse, you know, you'd be doing the kind of group rehab sessions. And because I wasn't allowing my heart rate to go above 120, 120, 125. I'd actually, you know, get to, a, it's actually not much you can do. <laughs> and so often I'd be there not do, and, you know, so obviously guys knew the situation, but um, it was it was difficult for me because I just wanted to get on and try and get better. Anyway, about nine, nine months in, a year later, nine, ten months, I started having a couple of uh, yeah, uh, coughing episodes where I was bringing up blood. And <clears throat> there was one that was quite, Actually, I go back. I'd already coughed up a bit of shrapnel during a, a a rehab session, and so they were a bit like, "Well, this is not, you know, there's obviously stuff still floating around." But there, there'd been no blood with that. Um, but then I started having internal bleeds. I had one. I kept quiet about. I didn't tell anyone. Stupid. Why? I don't know. Utterly stupid. You know, you got shrapnel inside yourself, and I was just a bit like. Oh. Uh, and then the next time, it was like serious. I couldn't breathe. I remember I could feel just like kind of I was like I had to go eh, to clear to be able to breathe and then I'd bring up you know literally um you know 100 200 mil of blood and then and that was you know fortunately it stopped it lasted about 10 minutes but that was a bit of like okay they're up straight up to Birmingham I wasn't I was at home at that point as well so they had me in hospital for a week they needed an emergency thoracotomy where they then split you open again fortunately it stopped um and the, the consultants were like look we need to do something about this. It's clearly not going to stay still. 
I was like, okay, so what do you suggest? And they're like, well, we're going to have to cut you open. I went, okay. And they said, but you're going to have to elect for it. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you've got to decide. I said, well, what's your, what's your professional opinion? Well, we can't tell you. <laughs> Not even a, but off the record. Though. No, but that's Not what I tried to get out. Record. I said, what do you mean you can't tell me? Well, it's got to be your decision because, again, we, you know, we've never done this type of operation. This is uncharted waters. Uh, highly chance, high chance of you dying. You know, that you have to decide. And I'm like, oh. I said, okay, what happens if I have another severe bleed and I get rushed in? What will you do? And he's like, well, we'll do an emergency, we'll cut you open there and then and get on with it. I was like, okay, would you rather do that or a planned one where I say, cut me open? And they said, well, of course, we'd like to plan it. And I'm like, okay, do it, <laughs> cut me open. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I get it. I get it. They got to. Yeah, yeah. Are you right now, though? Yeah, so they went in, I think it was about seven hours. They, they took out, in the end, 15 pieces of shrapnel, kind of that, yeah, 20, 20 mil size down to small bits. Um, and so it was a bit frustrating because the rehab then kind of has to start all over again. Um, but you know, at least then they got out the big bit next, you know, close to my heart. And so I could raise my heart rate and, you know, but I rehab, I could actually get a lot more out of it. Um, and yeah, I suppose the rest, then they could start looking at my knee. Cause I then I just start, start looking at my knee and other, you know, they, try, they tried microfracture surgery, trans, cartilage transfer. They start looking at my other bits cause the chest was always the kind of most severe life threatening injury. And so that was always the focus but once that was fairly secure. Um, Albeit two years ago, I coughed up a bit of shrapnel. <laughs> yeah, as you story. do, <laughs> as you do. I was ill for two weeks. I thought I had man flu, proper man flu. I had real aches and you know sweats, but I wasn't kind of you know sneezing, runny nose or anything like that. I just thought oh, it was proper flu. Um, if proper, you know, get to the afternoon, I'd be hanging out, literally just really aching. I just have to just kind of go to bed, and it lasted two weeks, and um, uh. <laughs> I was she'll help me hate this my my girlfriend now we, we we were having sex and I was literally climaxing <laughs> and I'm like Ugh! I start coughing up shit and she's like what is it what is it what is it and basically I think the the, the, the I then coughed up <laughs> go on, go on. coughed up a bit of shrapnel <laughs> all this shit Ali, came up that is Ali yeah, mate exactly. that's how hard I come <laughs> Fuck yeah. and this and it was like you know like a brown i can only describe it, it a bit like if you've got like a soggy digestive it's like brown shit there's no blood and there's this bit of shrapnel it's about that you know it's about Send eight me. eight ten mm. mil in diameter um it was jagged it wasn't like a round <laughs> and i was like and she's like what? i was like ah. i just coughed up a bit of shrapnel and she's like fucking hell so i was like oh okay so i unfortunately i got one of my consultants, uh, a couple of consultants, I got their their phone numbers. They're awesome. And I've kind of mess. I messaged. I didn't phone. I messaged and and said, "Oh, you know, I've, I've just coughed this up. You know, I, I, during exertion, <laughs> I've coughed this up. I sent him a photo. I said, you need to know, I've been ill for the last two weeks. I thought I had man flu. Don't know. Might, don't know if it's related. So he's like, right, get up to Birmingham. Went up oh, CT scans and I'm like." Oh. And he's like, oh, well, we didn't think there was any more shrapnel. I said, I oh, know, you said there was no more shrapnel in there. I said, but clearly, he went, well, you, you can't see everything. Anyway, next day, I felt right as rain. And the, basically, this shrapnel, obviously, it started moving. And I'd been ill for two weeks. So I guess at that point, it moved into areas where the body was going, what the fuck is this for an object? Trying to kind of get it out. And eventually, it made its way into my airway, and I'd cough the bugger up. Body's amazing, isn't it? Incredible. The body's amazing. Incredible. Incredible. Mate, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So, and um, I know all of before before we go on to the shameless plug opportunity, uh, mate, that was a fucking absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, Just a you, shit you, shit dick, really. I'm not really actually said you, my... You, you, no, no. You, no, it's not, mate. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear, but it's interesting to hear. All the stories are different. Um, and uh, and plus, <coughs> you know, for the guys who don't make it, it's, you... you, you you're telling like yeah. it like it was on the ground. I mean, um, just going before I forget, are you happy for me to put you in touch with Chris's missus? Yeah, yeah, no. But I, I mean, say, <coughs> he's like he's doing well, but mate, probably the same with like, your family. Like, it'd be really comforting for them to hear. I yeah, think no, from someone who's been in the position Chris I'm, is in now. Scary for and I, yeah, I will because my my dad had a triple heart bypass. A year, I didn't mean to put you on the spot earlier. I, I apologize. No, 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 so, no, no, a couple of years ago, and there was you know so that whereas for you know for the heart they go in through the front, they split your rib cage through the front, and <clears throat> yeah, he's yeah. 
having the only similarities here between you and him is induced coma. No, no, no I'll this come on. Like, I'll okay. come on to that. I'll come on to that. Obviously, it's about the drugs, basically they <clears> use. Yeah. But no, the reason I said and I said to my dad, I said, look, when you when you come out of this, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna, you know, there's potential that you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna feel under threat, all these kind of things from the, you know, the drugs they use. And it wasn't an induced coma; it's similar stuff, ketamine, morphine, all that. And um, he was, and he constantly. I remember him, him saying, "Oh, they're trying to kill me. Everyone's trying to kill me. The hospital staff, you know." He he kind of had he had very different um, challenges mentally. What his brain was telling him, but I remember actually, I, uh, I'd visited him during the day. And I was at home, I had a phone call, and the doctors were like, "Look, you need to speak to him." And I was like, "Remember, Dad, I'm telling you, it's not real. It's okay. They're not. No, no, they're trying to hurt me. They're trying to hurt me. The doc, you know, and all this kind of stuff." Um, and so similar thing, yeah, I will have a word of her because, yeah, it's, you, you might come round from the injury. She may not want to. I'll, no, I'll ask no, 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 yeah, no, no. She may not yeah, want to. Um, shameless plug, mate. We didn't get onto Mission Motorsport. I mean, like I said, Mission Motorsport, got James Cameron coming on. Yeah, yeah. So he, um, and that is to talk about Mission Motorsport, which is amazing. Which, but uh, So that's how I got into motorsport, yeah, through them. Just quickly going back to your military career. Uh, major at 29. Yeah. Fucking flyer, weren't you? <laughs> flyer, flyer. When, when did you get in? 18. Uh, yeah, straight from school. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, I was I was off to do a, an engineering degree, and I went to the careers office, and because a mate of mine had passed out of Marines as a Marine, I went to his passing out parade, and I was like, oh, "This looks awesome." And I, I aspirate. I thought I want to be Special Forces because you know, I want to jump through windows like they did in the eighties, and you know, in the the embassy. And I thought, well, what's what's the best thing you can get into pre Special Forces? Was Marines first, and, and, then, the the Paris, right, you made and the then the Paris, and then the Paris. <laughs> And I thought at the time I thought oh I just passed my driving test and I thought oh you know I want a, want a decent car surely you get paid more as an officer and there was no other reason <laughs> and I went to careers office and said oh I want to join as an officer and he went he went yeah go and get a degree and then come back no one's no one's got in as an officer without a degree for four years and I was like well I can't I've got my A levels give me a chance if I don't get in I'll go and get a degree and then come back and amazingly I got in yeah <laughs> uh, Mission Motorsport I'll cover that with James you got like 25 podiums, haven't you, when you're racing? Oh, yeah, for the car, yeah, yeah. Introduced motorsport through gym whilst I was in rehab at Mission Motorsport. Yeah, raced so, catering for four years. I'm now an instructor, a coach, and then uh, Invictus Games racing. So, right, so how can people follow you racing? How can people follow you? Uh, yeah, cheesy social media plug, I guess. Yeah, Twitter, Stephen McCulley, at Stephen McCulley. Instagram, at Steve.McCulley. Uh, they're the personal ones. So M-C-C-U-L-L-E-Y. Yes, yeah. correct. Well remembered. Um... I got my bike business that I set up whilst I was in rehab. Leos. Leos bikes. L I O S. Yeah, L I O S bikes. Named after your my daughters. Kids, Lily and Oscar. Yeah. Oh, son and daughter. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, uh, that's, sorry. We didn't even talk about that. Both of those, yeah. In, yeah. So, yeah, but Leos is it. I mean, fuck it, I'm going to retire. But Leos is interesting because you invented the, the lightest ever fold up bike. Yeah, back in 2015. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I know my shit. Mate. You do. You've done your research. <laughs> and I've not even mentioned any of this. <laughs> But no, my big big thing now is splitting my time between Leos bikes and uh, motorsport, kind of basically trying to progress my personal career, uh, motorsport as an instructor and coach, but also um, Invictus. I've taken on Invictus Games Racing. Um, right, tell me what that is then. So uh, three years ago, this is going to be very quick, James Holder, co-founder of Superdry, uh, who races Aston Martins himself, approached the Invictus Foundation and said, I want to uh, give the opportunity for some injured folk to race at the very highest levels, GT racing. This is this is serious seven-figure you know, a year racing. Um, and I want to do it for a, a, a military cause foundation. He said, and he also pledged money to the foundation. So there's no charity money whatsoever. This is his personal money. It's not super dry money, his personal money, three years worth. And so over that period, uh, bespoke Jaguar GT4 race cars were built uh, in, in 2017. In 2018, last year was our first season of racing. Uh, it was a tough year because brand new cars with no factory support, you know, it was tough. We had a lot, you know, a lot of uh, mechanical issues. You know, we, we, we only finished half the races we entered. But then this year, amazing success. Uh, you know, we kind of uh, four, five, five podiums. Um, you know, we fir- put the, ja- the first race of the season, we put Jaguar on the podium for the first time in 22 years. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's been seriously good. But that... He he always James Holder always said it's going to be three years and that was it and so um, so I'm now kind of taking on the team with a bold vision to um, progress. What year are you in now? 
So this is in theory year three. We had two years of racing. The first year was actually building the cars. You're prepping for going solo then in year four. Not so, well, not so. No, I, I basically what I wanted to say. There's only been a, you know a hand, handful of injured guys involved. Um, what I want to do is basically um, increase the the veteran involvement because there's a real synergy between motorsport and the military, and I think a ex military motorsport team could be very successful. So I want to build the team. I want you know engineers, truckies logisticians you know all sorts catering marketing communications can all be ex-military and do a really good job so i basically want to kind of create a whole team around ex-military and compete at the highest levels and what's that that fucking sounds awesome mate, by the way yeah I, I don't, how do people follow that at racing invictus that's another podcast no that is yeah. you've got another <laughs> podcast to do at racing invictus right uh steve it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for having me here's the time uh Best wishes to Chris Shirley. Yes, definitely. And thanks for your support there. And uh, anything else? No, thank you. Fucking awesome. Cheers, mate. Cheers, bud.